All right. All right, well, welcome to CC Colloquium for uh, Wednesday, February 3rd. Um, we apparently have no announcements from CC leadership today, so we'll just get right to it um, and uh, turn it over to Steve Semkin to introduce a uh, person who really needs no introduction, but uh, Steve will do it anyway. Exactly, so Steve, thank you, ahead. Ariel. Thank you, Ariel, exactly. Um, so yeah, it's my great pleasure to introduce Pref uh, President's Professor Steve Reynolds, known to everybody here in CC. Uh, revered in CC. Uh, Steve received his undergraduate geology degree from University of Texas at El Paso and a master of science and PhD degrees in structure, tectonics, and regional geology from the University of Arizona. Uh, after his PhD, he spent 10 years at the Arizona Geological Survey directing the geologic framework and mapping program there. And uh, among uh, many of the products there was the 1988 State Geologic Map of Arizona, which is still uh, you know, in tremendous use today. Um, Steve teaches a number of, of field and structural and uh, regional geology courses, as well as teaching methods in the geosciences. Um, he has been the president of the Arizona Geological Society, and he's, Steve has authored and edit, or edited over 200 geologic maps, articles, and reports, including the 866-page Geologic Evolution of Arizona, known to many as, as the Big Red Book. Um, of course, people know too that he has authored or co-authored a number of award-winning textbooks, uh, Structural Geology of Rocks and Regions, and the, uh, the Exploring Geology series, Exploring Geology, Exploring Earth Science, Exploring Physical Geography, uh, as well as the, uh, the Lab Manual for Geology 103. Um, for over 20 years, Steve has also, besides doing geologic research on structure, tectonics, and mineral deposits of, of the Southwest, he's also done extensive science education research on student learning in college geology courses, especially the, uh, the role of visualization. Um, Steve is known for innovative teaching methods, has received numerous teaching awards, and was an NAGT, National Association of Geoscience Teachers, distinguished speaker. Uh, he's still a very common, uh, uh, very frequent in, uh, invited speaker at workshops for innovative teaching methods. He's also been a longtime industry consultant in mineral, energy, and water resources, environmental issues, and has received outstanding alumni awards from UTEP and the University of Arizona. And as I said before, he was uh, designated as a president's professor. And it's been my great pleasure to know Steve for more than 20 years and collaborate with him and co-teach with him in many different uh, settings and really owe a great deal to, to Steve for what I've learned. So with that, I will now turn it over to Steve, who's going to be talking to us today about the Mesozoic evolution of Western Arizona and Southeastern California. Take it away, Steve. Okay, thanks, Steve. After that introduction, I'm not sure I should even give a talk. Come on. Uh, anyway, so what we're going to do today is it's, it's mostly kind of old school geology. Uh, we discovered a bunch of stuff by doing geologic mapping and stratigraphic studies and doing kind of standard geologic things like correlating units from one region to another based on the characteristic of the rocks, trying to figure out which rocks are oldest, which ones are youngest, not easy out in this country because sometimes the rocks are upside down due to later deformation. And uh, we're also doing things like uh, geochronology with detrital zircons to try to really tie down the ages of some of these units. So we'll do that. And let me share my screen here and away we go. Okay, and it's just me on the talk, but you know, a, a lot of this work I did with Nancy Riggs at uh, NAU, and I've had a, a number of students that have worked with me here at ASU, and Nancy's had a bunch of students that have worked with her at NAU, and, and so it's, it's really been a collaboration between uh, the two schools. Okay, so let's talk about the context. So you're here, there's Phoenix off in the lower right. Here's Blythe, which is just over into California along I-10. I'm gonna just show you where we are. Here's Parker, also in Arizona. And here's Wickenburg. So we're really looking at this area here, this kind of you know four-sided area between those two. Plus we go a little bit into California. So uh, it, it's an area that not many people know about. It, it fortunately for me, when I was uh, hired by the Arizona Geologic Survey to do a new geologic map, none of these mountain ranges were mapped. 
And so we got to be the first person, the first people to actually go out and map these places. And we just mapped one mountain range after another. And the, the kind of discoveries we made were just phenomenal. So some of the ranges that we'll talk about, Harquahela, or and uh, the little Harquahela, they're related. The Granite Wash Mountains, a lot of people know about because Phil Christensen takes them to, uh, they're on remote sensing trip. The Plumosa Mountains between ba between beautiful Baus and uh, Quartzite. And then the Buckskin Mountains, which is just south. Here's the Colorado River coming down this way. And here's the Bill Williams River coming in from east to west. And the Buckskins is just south of that. And then we also have done a lot of work in the Palins and the Big Maria Mountains, which are down in here. So those are the two main mountain ranges in California we've been working in. But we're... Nancy and I are extending our work uh, a lot. And, and she, coincidentally, unrelated, she's giving a colloquium talk later in the semester. And just for reference, here's the Colorado Plateau. And between the two of those, sorry, a truck parked and it's shining hey. a big light on me. Uh, hey, Steve, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even interrupt, but we're not seeing your full screen slides. We're just seeing your, your PowerPoint window. Um, I don't know if you have two displays and we're seeing it on the wrong screen or something like that. Okay, let me... Let me see what's going on here. Let me stop sharing and do that again. I'm going to turn my video off too, just so you know. Didn't mean to interrupt, but figured you want us to see it and it's everything in its full glory. Yeah. Can you see it? Uh, yes, we seem to see just your PowerPoint now. We are not seeing your desktop. Okay, well, that was weird. Yeah, I, I shared just that. So, okay. Uh, so anyway, so 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 the Colorado Plateau is up here. So you can see that, right, Ariel? Yes. You see, yep. You can, okay, you can see the word. Uh, and but between the Colorado Plateau and this country is the is the Arizona transition zone, and the Arizona transition zone does not have uh, many exposures of Paleozoic rocks. It, it has them kind of close to the plateau, but as you get away from it, like in the Bradshaws, there aren't any, and so. The, one of the challenges in working in, in Arizona is you don't have a way to directly tie things on the Colorado Plateau with this country out in Western Arizona. Before we worry about the Mesozoic though, there are a couple big complicating factors. So here's a map that shows where Mesozoic rocks are shown in green. And you see there's little spots of them around and Paleozoic rocks in blue uh, and then in, in red are places where you have uh, crystalline rocks like metamorphic rocks and granitic rocks that have been incredibly sheared in, in what we call metamorphic core complexes. And these mountain ranges essentially have big normal faults around them. And we figured out a long time ago that these rocks had been basically shoved back under the edge of the transition zone by this amount. So anything below those faults, which is all these mountain ranges I'm talking about, were once uh, 45, 50 kilometers further to the northeast and at, at depth. So that's one complicating factor. And you can see it's part of this thing called the Colorado River Extensional Corridor. And these rocks have been normal faulted and tilted, and they've had all kinds of interesting things done to them. And then the other complicating factor is this structure. It's called the Maria Folden Thrust Belt. Again, this was a feature that, you know, by just doing geologic mapping, we found it. And, uh, and we got it. If you find it, sometimes you get to name it. So we named it. And, uh, and there are a big series of overturned folds and thrust faults, and it's really complicated up the, the relationship. So I'll talk a little bit about those as well. Okay, so let's start in the Paleozoic. And essentially what you had is the, the North American continent was here. There's the transcontinental arch, which is uh, you know, a little higher than normal, but still not so high that it doesn't get flooded once in a while. And then more uh, you know, continental shelf wrapping around it. It's a little controversial what it does down here, but that's an option. And, uh, and so in Paleozoic times, it was really dominated by the seas going in and out uh, sand dunes blowing in, stream deposits, but all fairly low, you know, close to sea level, so easily flooded if sea level goes up a bit. In the late Paleozoic, it's much more complicated because we have a continental collision going on in the Appalachians and the Wachita's, and uh, 
And so it caused mountain ranges out here in the West. We call them the ancestral Rockies because a lot of these old mountain ranges are in the same places where the Rockies are today. But it made basins and it, it made things a little complicated. But you can also see that we're starting to get more, uh, more plate tectonic kind of boundaries out to the West. And then by the, by the Jurassic, we have a trench off the Southwestern coast and it's causing volcanoes. And here's our area, we're in the middle of it at this point. And, uh, and then inland from it, this is a case where you're looking at the Navajo sandstone, a big uh, sandy desert uh, that deposited the Navajo sandstone uh, formation. And this area had to have a transition from it was just part of the continental shelf to suddenly it was kind of between the, 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 the volcanoes and the, the plat continental platform to suddenly now you're, you, you're in the middle of the volcanic arc. So there's a transition in both space and time that this, air, this region uh, exposes. So let's start with the Paleozoics. This is the Paleozoic section in the Big Maria. It's actually just the top half of the Paleozoic section. Uh, this is the this is the Supai, which in the Grand Canyon is red, but out here the, everything's metamorphosed. So these are kind of maroon quartzites. Uh, there's some Coconino. You can't see it. And then all this big gray cliff is Kaibab. I had a student, Gail Morrissey, and she and I measured this entire stratigraphic section, old school wise, with the Jacob staff and making notes because we wanted to see if we could track these units as they get deformed and whether each unit could be recognized in in places where these rocks are more deformed than they are here but so you can see it's a pretty good paleozoic section you know a kilometer and a half in thickness something like that and then the mesozoic sec uh, section has the lowest unit of it is called the buckskin formation and we named it for the buckskin mountains where we first documented this rock and figured out what it was and it has different parts. It has a lower part of the buckskin and an upper part. And then between those, there's a unit called the phyllite member. You can kind of see it right in here as this kind of gray slope, green, greenish gray slope. And so there are really these three parts of the buckskin. And there's a, there's a, there's a, a marker unit in here that we call the quartzite that uh, is right below the phyllite member, but it's kind of part of the lower buckskin. And so, so we have these three parts of the buckskin and uh, on top of that is a unit called the vampire formation. And I can't believe I had the luck of nobody had ever named something the vampire formation. You can't name something if the name's already been used, but for some reason, nobody ever thought about naming something the vampire formation. The vampire mine is up in this country. You have to name geologic formations after places. So, so anyway, so there's the vampire formation. And then a lot of times you have volcanics on top of this. They're not actually in this particular area. And then in here, you have a bunch of tertiary units sitting on top. So, so here's kind of the section. Uh, we don't care about the details. So there's a Paleozoic section in here. You can see that we use Grand Canyon words, uh, terms for most of this stuff, except for the Devonian, which we typically use the Southeast Arizona term, the Martin. But otherwise, you know, we use Coconino and Kaibab and Hermit Shale and Supai and all those, you know, terms you know of in the Grand Canyon. And then the Buckskin sits on top of that. And then the Vampire sits on top of that with a conglomerate at the bottom. And then the Jurassic volcanics sit on top of that. And then there's some other units I'm not going to talk about. Just to remind you what's on the Colorado Plateau. Uh, the Mesozoic units on the Colorado Plateau, the lowest one is the Moenkopi Formation. And it's a bunch of red beds, tidal flats. It has some gypsum in it, things like that. And then sitting on top of that is the Chinle Formation. And the Chinle has a bunch of reworked volcanic ash in it and or ash that settled out into the area, but most of that ash is probably reworked. It's the thing that forms a lot of the, the uh, painted desert. It's the host of the petrified forest uh, trees in Petrified Forest National Park. And then sitting on top of the Chinle are a variety of units that, we, that are grouped together called the Glen Canyon Group. And in this particular case, there's the Wingate Sandstone, which is a latest Triassic, early Jurassic rock. And then there's the Navajo up here, and there's another unit, the Cayenta, in the middle. But we're not going to talk in detail about those units. One thing about the Moenkopi that's distinctive about it is it contains gypsum deposits. 
And so when you're trying to say, how do our rocks in Western Arizona correlate to these rocks on the Colorado Plateau? And it turns out that the lower buckskin has gypsum in it. And so when John Spencer and I were studying out there, John Spencer was a geologist, the Arizona survey. When he and I were studying out there, we looked at this and we said, you know, this stuff has got gypsum, the Moen Kopi's got gypsum. This stuff must be equivalent to the Moen Kopi, even though our stuff's schist and, and hydride and phyllites and things like that. And on uh, here at Holbrook, it's uh, red beds and a little bit of gypsum. So we, we did a lot of work. And uh, so we recognized that the lower buckskin, which isn't shown here, but it would be off here to the right. And then there's this uh, quartzite member that's at the very top of the lower. I had a student, Eric Hargrave, one of the nicest individuals anybody's ever met. And he did a thesis out here and we focused on this, to some extent what was in, the, in the, these units. And we recognized that the phyllite member was really different than the quartzite, quartzite member or the lower member. It had what looked like a lot of volcanic debris in it. And so at the time we looked at that and we said, well, okay, the transition from red beds to volcanic debris, that sounds like that's Chin Li. And so we, we concluded that the phyllite member was probably Chin Li. There's an upper member that's one of the worst rocks anyone's ever seen in thin section. Uh, it, it looks like if, if cats threw up on your, on your uh, petrographic slide, that's what it looks like. And uh, so we think it was probably a sandstone with some calcareous, uh, matrix to it, but it's a terrible looking rock and it's bedded, but we, so we're not sure what it is. It's possible that's a Glen Canyon rock. Like, you know, could be, could be Wingate, could be one of the other uh, units that like the Owl Rock, which probably should be in the Glen Canyon group. And uh, here's the same section in the Palins, but you notice in here, so here are the phyllite members on top of the quartzite member. Here, the quartzite members on top of the phyllite. And that's because these rocks have been overturned in a big fold. And so in, in these rocks, up is still up in the buckskins. In the palins, up is now down in here because of the rocks have been overturned by folding. So, so Nancy and I and a, a, a student named uh, Taylor Sanchez from, uh, from Acoma, Pueblo in New Mexico, we did a, uh, we did a, a detrital zircon study of the buckskin and what we found is the, the, you have a lot of zircons. So what, with the tidal zircons, what you do, you take the sandstones and you grind them up and you separate the zircons. And then you, you hit each zircon that you want to date with a, with a laser and you get an age for that individual laser spot. And so, so what you can see is, you know, there's a few Archean zircons in here, but there's quite a lot of, of this peak here is like 1.7, 1.6. There's a lot of crust in Arizona that's that age. If you go to the Grand Canyon, the crust is that age. If you go up around Payson, the Precambrian rocks are that age, the Bradshaws. So that stuff's coming from there. All of this stuff in here, though, that's 1 billion, that, those are ages that we don't have a lot of in Arizona. At least we don't have a lot of rocks that age that can produce zircons. But the Appalachians has a ton of that stuff. Uh, those rocks are called Grenville. And they're very rich in zircon, zirconium, and they're very rich in zircons. And so the, they're, if, if you start a road in the Appalachians, you get a bunch of these zircons out. So the thing that's interesting, one, is that we're out here in Western Arizona. And in the early Triassic, the sediment was largely dominated by grains that originated from the uh, Appalachians. But then over here, there's a, a bunch of younger dates like 300, 250. And we, we look at the youngest populations and it, this tells us that this rock has to be younger than this age because it has it's containing these zircons. So they, those zircons had to come out of an older rock, get eroded, end up in the lower member of the buckskin. And so the, the age there is 250. So we know that the, these rocks in the buckskin are gonna be in the Triassic somewhere. And uh, and we can, the other thing we can do is we can compare that to what's actually in the Moen Kopi. And so for this, the same study that Nancy and Taylor and I did, uh, we collected a sample of the Moen Kopi uh, kind of up by Holbrook, not exactly. But, uh, and you can see it's about the same data for the youngest grains. And it has about the same signature. It's got this 1.7, it's got a big Grenville kick. And then there's a whole bunch of five and 600s. 
those are those are we don't have any of those rocks in the western u.s so all those things had to come from the appalachians be transported across the whole continent by big river systems and then you know brought into here and so so what this data shows is that the intuition we had that the the there's gypsum here and there's gypsum here that that, that the buckskin was likely to be moan copy is borne out by the detrital zircons. They have the same detrital zircon signature. And so at this point, we are, you know, we don't, I don't think you prove anything in science, frankly, ever, but you can make yourself, a, you know, 99.9993% sure. And, uh, and so we're, we're sure that the Moenkopi and the lower buckskin are the same uh, time and probably laterally equivalent. And then when we do the same thing to the to the phyllite member, we see that it has an age of about 220. And I didn't show it, but Nancy's done a whole bunch of work in the uh, Chinle formation on the Colorado Plateau petrified forest, and it has a whole bunch of 220 million year old zircons. So again, the 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 conclusion that Eric and I came to based on just physical stratigraphy and the rock types is borne out by what the detrital zircons are. So we now have a Chinle equivalent out here in Western Arizona. And uh, there was always a problem, which I'll talk about a bit about, you know, is there any Chinle off the Colorado Plateau? And the answer is yes. And so here was the problem. The Chinle had all this volcanic ash in it and up, up to about five or 10 years ago, we hadn't, there weren't any plutons or any volcanoes that were that age to contribute this, uh, this ash. And so it was called the Chinle problem. But the work that Nancy and, and Andy Barth and people like that have done out in the Mojave Desert, uh, they found those plutons and, the, and those volcanic rocks. And, and we also found stuff that in the, in, the, in the lower buckskin, it looks like it's really close to volcanic sources. And so, you know, so the, the buckskin, the, the, the uh, phyllite member of the buckskin is basically spanning the, the, what you see on the Colorado Plateau with, with the magmatic arc that's in the Colorado out in the Mojave Desert. Okay, on top of the buckskin is this unit called the vampire and a lot of it's a quartzite. And uh, a lot of it has big Aeolian cross beds. And so from a, from a superficial look at it, it looks like it's Navajo sandstone uh, or equivalent to it, or at least some Aeolian sandstone like you see in the Glen Canyon group. And uh, this is some new data. We had a student, Chad Kwiatkowski, that was at ASU as an undergrad and he went to do a master's with Nancy. And, uh, and we've been working on this project and this is some of Chad's data. And, uh, and so this is out of the, uh, out, out of, actually, th no, this is Joel's data, sorry. We have another student named Joel Kane that's working on that. And, uh, and this is out of, the, out of the vampire. And what you can see, it's got way younger zircons. It's got this, this peak at about 190, 180, 170. And so that puts it in the same time interval as the typical Glen Canyon group rocks. So the detrital zircons have really helped us pin down where we think these rocks uh, fit with regards to the units on the Colorado Plateau. And so this is a generalized idea of it. So here's the lower member of the buckskin is Moenkopi. The quartzite member is probably also Moenkopi. The phyllite member is Chinle. And this upper unit is probably one of these units that was put into the Chinle but shouldn't have been like the Alrock member. Uh, and uh, there's some other things. Uh, and then there's the vampire formation in here. And we think that that's basically related to Glen Canyon group rocks uh, in there. And then we have things, uh, uh, we have volcanics on top and there are units like the Carmel and the Page that have volcanic beds in them on the Colorado Plateau. So, you know, right now it's a pretty clear uh, correlation of what our rocks are versus what's on the Colorado Plateau. Well, one thing Eric and I focused on is there was an unconformity, there is an unconformity between the buckskin and the vampire. And so we went out and mapped it. And so here's the, the vampire shown in orange and the buckskin units are shown in these greenish colors. Here's lower buckskin, here's the quartzite member, here's the phyllite, and here's the upper. And as you follow along this contact, you can see that one by one, those units disappear. So here's the edge, there's no more uh, upper buckskin in this direction and then the phyllite goes away and finally this 
basal unit of the vampire sits straight on the quartzite member. So, uh, you know, so there's an unconformity there. And it, along with that unconformity, the vampire has a bunch of conglomerates. And this is one reason why we wanted to assign this unit a different name. We thought it was equivalent to the Navajo, at least part of it, but it doesn't look anything like the Navajo. So we did not want to use that same name here. Uh, and there's another unit in Southern Nevada called the Aztec Sandstone, but this doesn't look anything like the Aztec. So that's why we gave it a new name. And these conglomerates have a whole bunch of pieces of Precambrian basement in it. So you said, well, we, we had a kilometer and a half of Paleozoic rocks, and then we had the lower buckskin, another two or 300, 400 meters of rocks. But somehow we uplifted all those rocks enough that we exposed the Precambrian basement close by. And you know, some of the, some of the, these are pretty rounded, but some of them aren't, they're angular and pretty close by. And so from, from this, from the unconformity and from this conglomerate, we recognize that there was a previously unknown early Mesozoic uplift event out here in, in Southwestern North America. And, you know, nobody knew about it. It just, you know, once you start doing the, looking at the stuff and exploring it, you do it. And I might point out, you know, there's a couple ways to do science. One is you have a hypothesis and you try to test it, but that's only one way. The other way is you just go out and you do stuff, you explore. And so this was a case where we were out in the buckskins because the mountain range needed to be mapped. It's not like we had a hypothesis that there was a, uh, of early Mesozoic uplift out here. We just said, we're just gonna go map and see what's there. And then we kept our eyes open and we said, oh, look what's out here. And uh, so you, we just followed it where it went. So there are these, at least two or three routes into, into doing science. One is hypothetical deductive reasoning and the other is just pure exploration. And both of them yield good results. So here are the sections. So, you know, in the, in the Palins, here's the vampire and it's sitting on lower buckskin, it's sitting on buckskin, the whole buckskin sections there and same thing in the buckskins. But as we go in other places, here are the vampires sitting on Tapit sandstone, the Cambrian unit. And in the Southern Plumosas, the vampire conglomerate is sitting on Precambrian basement. And so there are places out here that you had to have enough uplift that you stripped off all the Paleozoic rocks. I personally think that this uplift is why Southern California from here to San Diego has almost no Paleozoic rocks. I think this was the uplift event that stripped those rocks off. Okay, one of the things to, to, that we wanted to try to figure out is to you take the, the stratigraphic units and the thicknesses uh, as they're contoured here on the Colorado Plateau and see how our rocks fit into those. And in general, I would say that the rocks in Western Arizona are consistent with the way that these contours of, of thicknesses are coming towards Western Arizona, both in the Paleozoic, both in where hermits present or not present, and also the, the, uh, the Triassic. And this is something that Chad is working on, trying to, to figure out how to contour this stuff, measuring old school, measuring stratigraphic sections of these places so we have good thicknesses and then trying to reconstruct them. So in spite of all the things that have happened here, the Maria Fold and Thrust Belt and, this, uh, uh, and all the extension, these rocks are still in about the right place. Okay, so let's talk about the complications. This is from the Little Maria's mountain range in California. And what you can see is a big isoclinal fold with the red wall limestone is this white layer mapping around, a wrapping around a, a infolded remnant of supai. And then the Devonian is wrapping around here as this tan stuff. So there are huge mountain sized folds. And so all these Paleozoic and Mesozoic rocks have been affected by this event. It's one of the most beautiful structural belts anywhere in the world. It's just amazing stuff. And it's, uh, we named it, when we named the Maria Fold and Thrust Belt, we named it for the Big Maria Mountains. And this is a view. So here is the, in, in the Big Maria Mountains, you have an upright Paleozoic section and an overturned Paleozoic section, the same section. And here the units are very thick and here they're very thin. So like, for example, this is, there's a, a pit here, that's the red wall limestone, here's the supai, and then this is all kaibab, and then it goes into a big fold and, you know, you can see it up on the skyline. I'll show you some other pictures of that. So you have a, a thick section and a thin section. Here's the, the thick section in the foreground 
this is this is like uh, supai, coconino, kaibab in here, and here's those same units on the overturned limb of the fold coming around uh, the backside. So it projects behind these these hills here. And what Gail Morrissey and I did, we, we went in and we wanted to see what the subunits are. So like in this in the supai, this is the 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 normal thickness upright section. You can see it's got a massive upper part and then a stripy lower part. And uh, so, you know, we measured through here and we said, oh, we ought to be able to see these things. When you get into the overturned section, here's the whole supai in the overturned section. It's about 4% of what it is in the normal section. So as it got folded over here, it's, uh, you know, it's just, it got really thin. But you can see in the thin section, this is overturned, so this is the top. So this is the massive upper part, and here's the stripy lower part. So even though the section was originally this thick, when it got overturned and thinned, it retained those units. And that's what Gail and I found. Every single one of these formations, the Kaibab, the Red Wall, the Supai, all the subunits in it, we could recognize them in this overturned and thinned Paleozoic section. Here's a couple students uh, measuring this section. And so something that is normally like three or 400 meters thick, you can see is, you know, maybe five meters thick, thereabouts, it's not much. And so I had a, a student, Tony Salem, and he mapped in the Big Marias, ASU student. And, uh, and here's his map. And so what you can see is you can see these big, this big, fold wrapping around the corner. And as these units come around the fold, they get thinner and thinner and thinner. And these are cute little things. You have an upside down Paleozoic section and you've then folded it. And so this is one of the few times you'll ever get to use these bizarre structural terms like an anti-formal syncline. I don't want to explain it. If you're an astronomer, just ignore me. Uh, anyway. And one of the other nice things, is one of the great things about being at uh, in CC is Phil Christensen needed some ground data for the, for his the thermal infrared uh, spectrometer. And so we flew a bunch of these mountain ranges with Tim's data of, of, in, on a plane. And this is the fold section. So this purple is the supai. This red is the, is the coconino, the way it's processed. Here's the kaibab with these blue churdy units in it. And then here's the vampire. There's a little bit of buckskin in here, but not much partly because of the unconformity. But then you can see these units go around and here's the overturned section. Here's the vampire, there, the, there's buckskin in here. Here's the, here's the kaibab. So this little belt here is equivalent to this belt here. Here's the, the coconinos here. There's the coconino, the supai's here. There's the supai. So this is what it looks like. I, it, I, I can't show these thicknesses in, their proper scale to, you know, because they're they're so thin. And uh, one of the really cool outcrops in this overturned section is here's the Cambrian Tapeat sandstone, and this is Precambrian granite, and this is the overturned Great Unconformity still preserved in these overturned and attenuated rocks. And the, the this first part of the of the of the granite, which would have been right below the 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 quartzite was being deposited has has micas in it because it, it was a weathering horizon. So not only did you preserve the great unconformity in an upside down manner with totally metamorphosed rocks. I mean, these rocks are verging on a nice. These rocks are quartzites, but you also have a, a paleo weathering horizon preserved. All right, so so that was out here in the Big Marias right there. And so we've got a couple other places to look at. We've got the Buckskins, we've got the Granite Wash Mountains, we've got the Little Harquahalas. So let's go to the Granite Wash Mountains. And uh, this was a mountain range that we got to map from scratch. It was great, wonderful stuff. And uh, this is what I think a geologic map ought to look like. It, you try to measure everything that's out there so that people know that you've looked at everything. And, uh, but the, the key here is there's a bunch of Mesozoic rocks here. And they're below big thrust faults that ultimately put Precambrian basement on top of this. And this is a big stack of really sheared metamorphic rocks, schists and things like that. Here's a cross section. Here's, the, here's this big overturned fold. 
with this thrust fault. So it's not just a thrust fault, it's thrust fault that's putting Precambrian Basin over an upside down section of rocks. And then the place where Phil takes the remote sensing people is out in here. So there's all these Paleozoic rocks people look at, but they're just slices out here. And uh, this is an example. Here's an upside down Kaibab limestone with a Jurassic volcanic rock sitting on top of it. And once you've folded rocks, you can, you can put younger rocks on older rocks, older rocks on younger rocks. You can do all kinds of stuff. And uh, luckily, Phil Christensen, bless his heart, flew Tim's out here. And, and so here's the section. Here's Devonian. Here's Supai. Here's Coconino. Here's Kaibab. There's a, a section parallel fault in here. Here's Supai. Coconino, Kaibab, another one of these faults. And Phil loves to take people to one of these little hills out here. There was a hill when I was mapping out here it, that uh, I walked up one, one side of the hill. It was just a little hill out in the flats. And I walked up one side of the hill and it was all, it was all carbonate. And I said, uh, okay, it, it, it's, it's this unit. And then I got up to the top of the hill. I looked down the other side. It was all white. And I said, okay, probably the same stuff. And you can't check every single thing. Uh, once we got the Thames and we looked at that, Phil and I went out in the field and we realized the whole north half of that hill had this red color, meaning it was all quartzite. And so this was a case where, you know, some of the shortcuts you take when you do geologic mapping, had I had that Thames data, I would have realized there was a problem there. So th the lesson for me was, if you've got really good remote sensing data, you use it. It also provides Phil a chance to take students out and say, look, the remote sensing got it right and Steve Reynolds got it wrong. So uh, anyway, so, so this is what the geologic map looks like. It's very complicated. So if you've been out here in, for Phil's class in remote sensing, this is the area you go. And here's the section. It's these guys out here you're looking at. And there are big thrust faults underneath you. It's just, it's a mess. Okay, we'll move on. Next one is the little Harquahalas. I should have pointed out down here. And you see this hill from I-10 as you're going between here and the California. Uh, and it's an upside down Paleozoic section. So there's Coconino here. Here's Supai. There's a fault. Here's Supai. Here's Redwall. Here's Devonian Martin. And on the backside here is Cambrian. So it's the whole Paleozoic section flipped upside down in one of these big folds of the Maria Fold and Thrust Belt. And one of the really cool things about it is it's nice little, you know, fairly small hill. So you can see the whole thing. You can take people there on a field trip. This is Kaibab. The Coconino out here is a quartzite. And so it gets busted up. So it's a slope. This is Supai. Here's Redwall. Here's Martin. And then on this backside here is the Cambrian. So again, the, the whole Paleozoic sections here, it's a little thin, but it's not bad. Uh, compared to the Maria's for sure. And, uh, but it's, it's still, it's overturned. And again, one of the cool things about this place is uh, I take people here on field trips and you essentially have the great unconformity overturned and it's still got the basal conglomerate of the Tapeats glued to the granite that was, that the, the Tapeats sandstone was deposited on. Okay, so uh, up in the Buckskins, uh, one last little place to visit. And uh, these are some of the cross sections. I don't want to go into the detail. I just want you to see how, how naughty this geology is. There's isoclinal folds, there's layer parallel faults, there's slices of granite in the middle of the section, and then there's normal faults in addition to all these thrust faults and all these big overturned sections. And most of these rocks in here are all overturned. They're all upside down. Uh, not totally upside down, but some of them are totally upside down. And, uh, and one of the cool places out here is just by Parker. And these are all Mesozoic and Paleozoic rocks here to the right. And this is all crystalline rocks, Precambrian granites and metamorphics here to the left. And those Precambrian rocks go from here all the way to San Diego. And so this is a case where the, you, have, you might ask why if, if all these rocks got uplifted and, and eroded away, uh, especially, you know, later, like, you know, 90 million years ago, 80 million years ago. Why do we still have them preserved? And the reason we still have them preserved is these Paleozoic rocks that I've been showing you were buried below big thrust faults that put Precambrian basement on top of everything. 
and then the whole region got uplifted and whatever Paleozoic rocks were on top of these Precambrian rocks got eroded away. But these rocks were preserved at depth because they had been buried underneath all these crystalline thrush sheets. So a reminder where we are. Uh, so, you know, we looked at some stuff in the Big Marias, we looked at stuff in the Buckskins, we looked at the Granite Wash Mountains, and we looked at the little Harkwa Halos. And uh, so when, you, when we're factoring this in, the other thing that's superimposed on this, so here's the Maria belt down here. But then the other thing that's going on is you have this, this, these, this stretch of the crust that's been highly extended. I mean, it's been stretched to like twice its original width. And, and one of the components of that is you brought these deep rocks here in these red patterns up along a, a gently inclined normal fault that brought those from out of the transition zone. And here's that fault. This is in the, uh, in the buckskin in the Rawhide Mountains. And, uh, and so these are tertiary rocks like, like, like at A Mountain. I mean, almost same rocks. And these are really deep rocks. So these are really big faults. These faults are taking rocks that were at 10 or 15 kilometers at depth, and you're bringing these rocks up and juxtaposing those against rocks that were accumulating at the surface at the same time that these rocks were 10 or 15 kilometers at depth. So these are really big faults with, we think, on the order of 45 to 50 kilometers of horizontal displacement. And this is in the Buckskins. This is a place I often take field trips to. Here's the actual fault in here. And this is all lower buckskin in here. And so in this case, you put lower buckskin, which had been metamorphosed because of all the thrusting against uh, deep crystalline rocks. So let's talk about how this the evolution happens. So when we talk about metamorphic core complexes, the term comes, well, I was, it's complicated where the term came from, but we use it for these mountain ranges that have a core of metamorphic igneous rocks. And they're interpreted to be the representation of gently inclined normal faults. By normal faults, we mean the rocks above the fault move down with respect to the rocks below the fault. And so in this case, if you're, if you're fairly close to the surface, you're fracturing the rock. And so we make something that's called brecciation. You're shattering the rocks and below you're shearing those rocks under under conditions that are more ductile you know just the rocks are flowing and shearing and and then with as this thing operates we'll watch what happens to the rocks below the the brittle ductile transition that's the it, rocks are cool enough above it to, to form brittly and hot enough below it to, to form ductly we'll watch what this unit does here and so with some amount of displacement, you're making tilted fault blocks in this little wedge above the fault. This is, this is what Papago Park is. Papago Park is one of these tilted fault blocks, uh, A Mountain, Hated Butte, Tempe Butte, whatever you want to call it. It's one of these. The Buttes by the Point, they're one of those. Uh, uh, Camelback Mountain is one of these. And so you made all these tilted fault blocks. And, that, and so th this is the reason why all the rocks around Phoenix are tilted is because they're in these tilted fall blocks. At least the, 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 the Cenozoic rocks are all tilted. And, but you're starting to now bring up these rocks that were at depth and bringing them close to the surface. And if you keep doing that, you get this. And so this is essentially a cross section from the South Mountains represented by here where these, these myelinitic rocks have been brought up to the surface, these sheared rocks. And here's A Mountain, Papago Park, and then here's the rest of the transition zone off to the northeast. And you can, you know, you can look at this two ways. You can say, well, maybe these rocks are sliding off of these. But of course, these rocks are connected to the rest of North America. And so you could say North America slid off the South Mountains. Or you can say the South Mountains were pulled out from underneath the edge of the transition zone. And I think that's a better way to look at it. And, and, you know, big amounts. We, we don't think the South Mountains Fault, which is down here, is quite as large, but it probably has 30 kilometers, 35 kilometers displacement. It might have 45 kilometers. But up in here, John and I were mapping, and we, we recognized up here, this is John Spencer, uh, we were mapping up here, and we recognized rocks above the fault that were a match for rocks below the fault. 
these were a bunch of landslide deposits and stuff like that, but we could we could say, said, hey, that looks like those rocks there. And uh, John Singleton of Colorado State came in, really great structural geologist. Uh, and uh, he came in and they did a bunch of geochronology in here and they pinned it. They said, these guys are exactly right. These rocks came exactly from that stuff. And the amount of displacement is 45 kilometers. And so when you take all of these rocks, like the Little Harquahalas and the Granite Wash, you have to displace them this amount. And so if you take that distance, and take the granite wash and take that same distance. It doesn't quite go under the edge of the transition zone, but it gets close. And so you really were shoving these Paleozoic and Mesozoic rocks underneath the edge of the Colorado Plateau, and then you pulled them back out later during the extension. So the Maria Folden Thrust Belt is probably a late Cretaceous structure. And uh, and so you shoved them under in the late Cretaceous and you brought them back out in the Cenozoic. That's it. I'll be glad to take any questions. I'll stop sharing my screen. Ariel, have you got anything for us? Great. Yeah, questions are coming in. So uh, folks, please put questions in the Q&A as always. And uh, um, also, if you want to raise your hand, I'm probably happy to call on people and give you a chance to speak. Um, so uh, a couple of questions uh, coming in already. Um, Tom Sharp asks, what event buried these rocks into the middle crust before they were pulled out by extension? Uh, we think it was essentially the Maria Folden Thrust Belt event, which is a south, it's mostly a south and southwest vergent thrust sheet. And so the other way to think of it is these rocks were shoved down into the northeast. And it happened at a time when there was a lot of compression all through the Western US, both in Nevada, Utah, and in, in Colorado, New Mexico, Utah. Uh, and so we, we think it was, you know, it's, it's basically related to the fact that you had a subduction zone off the West Coast and that that subducted slab was becoming more gentle with time. And as you do that, you've got to get a bunch of stuff out of the way. And so I think that that's what you, uh, you did. You basically, as as the as, as the subduction became low angle, you essentially just you know had stuff in the way. So if you can see my video, you know if if you if you have a, a subduction zone and it does this, there's a bunch of stuff in here that's got to get moved away. So, okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Jackie Monkowitz asks. Uh, so what's an anti syncline? A yes, we named anticlines and synclines officially not by their shape, but by where the oldest rocks are. In an anticline, the oldest rocks are in the middle. So in a normal fold, if you watch my video, in a normal fold, you have some old rocks down here and younger rocks on top, and you fold it, the oldest rocks are in the middle. But if you flip these rocks upside down, and then you do the same thing, the youngest rocks are now in the middle. And so that's the, so that you use the term anticline or syncline, to, to indicate where the oldest or, or the youngest rocks are in the middle and use the term antiformal or synformal to indicate the shape. Is it is it shaped like an A or is it shaped like a sink? Uh, Aaron Alexander asks, how would the island chains and volcanic arcs off the coast of Arizona and the Jurassic have affected ocean currents at the time? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. Certainly, the one thing is the, the Jurassic Arc in southwestern Arizona was on land. You know, it was a continental margin arc like the Andes or the Mexican volcanic arc or the Cascades. And so, but as you follow that arc up to the northwest, it goes offshore. So when you see rocks of this age in the, in the, in the Sierra Nevada, for example, they're marine rocks. So there was volcanism going on, but you, you're marine. So it's, it's exactly like the way that the volcanoes go from mainland Alaska into the Aleutian Arc. If you rotate Alaska and the Aleutians, you know, uh, 90 degrees, that's what it looked like here. So we were mainland Alaska, minus the bears, and the Aleutian Arc was what was going on in the Sierra Nevada. And so, so that offshore arc would have stopped a lot of ocean currents from getting, you know, too far into the continental edge, 
because you, you essentially have an offshore island arc that's disrupting the ocean currents. All right, uh, back to the deformation Everett asks, uh, Rachak, what was the duration of the deformation and how do you determine duration? Oh, that, that's a really hard one, actually. That, <laughs> that event is still really hard to, uh, to date. Uh, it, it really, the trouble is there are three big events out there. There's, there's an early event that's probably middle Cretaceous and then there's the big event, which is certainly late Cretaceous. And one of the things we look at is how young of rocks does, does it affect? And in the case of the Maria belt, it affects rocks that we think are about 80 million years old because those rocks have detrital zircons and tufts of that age. And the plutons come in at about 75 and they're undeformed. And so in that case, it's pretty tightly bracketed that a lot of that deformation probably happened certainly between 90 and 75. But whether it took all 15 million years, but you know, th these rocks had interesting things done to them. You know, a lot of geologists say, oh, these rocks suffered deformation. If you're, if you're a rock undergoing ductal deformation, you're not suffering, you're having fun. And so, uh, so, 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 you know, ductal deformation like that takes a while. And so I, I would bet that this event is prolonged, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 million years. Good question. Thanks, Art. Um, and so still on the theme of, of getting ages and geochronology and timing, uh, some anonymous person asks, how did the Appalachian zircons bypass the transcontinental arc? Okay, yeah. Uh, one thing is the transcontinental arch, which again is a very low, barely barely higher than the stuff on either side. It goes from northeastern Arizona up through, you know, Colorado and then heads towards like Wisconsin and places like that. And uh, but that was low enough that if the seas come up, it got buried by deposits. You know, the, the things like the red wall limestone, they go right over the top of it. So if, if you, it was pretty low and it I'm sure it was not continuous the whole way it had gaps in it. Uh, the the Appalachian zircons first start really showing up during the Supai time, so you know like 300 and something million, and that's about when the Appalachian the main event of the Appalachian orogeny happened, and that's when you really start flooding the Western U.S. with those zircons. The other thing that's interesting about that though is at that point the Appalachians was the continental divide for this mega continent. You know, I mean, Africa was part of it. South America was part of it. And and so the Appalachians, you know, for Pangaea, that was that was the continental divide. And so everything this side of the Appalachians had to go to the Pacific Ocean. And so it's like you're almost surprised that, you know, I mean, why wouldn't it come here? And And the other thing is this was a good case. I'm not a big fan of settled science or consensus or anything like that. There was a consensus that all of the rocks in the, in the, in the Supai, in the, in the, in the, in the, the Pennsylvania and Permian rocks in the Western US, all came from the local ancestral Rockies uplifts. And we, we told, stu I told students that lie for 25 years. And then Bill Dickinson and George Garrels came in and started doing detrital zircons on those. And it totally blew that consensus away. And so, it, it was, you know, it just, it just shows you that you, 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 you can't totally be sure because maybe there's new kind of data and it's going to totally overwhelm it. And the thing that's interesting is in many of these basins, not only is, are there Appalachian zircons, but they are swamping the locally derived zircons. In a lot of these, these places, you have more Appalachian zircons than you have stuff coming off the Ancestral Rockies, in spite of the fact the Ancestral Rockies were right here. But the Appalachians was a monstrous mountain range. I mean, it makes like anything on Earth look like child's play right now. And so the amount of erosion and the amount of debris that was eroded off the Appalachians is staggering. So um, there's a couple of bigger picture questions, but there's one more that's that's kind of on the specifics of the Southwest. Um, so Chad Kwiatkowski asks, why the different tilt of Camelback red beds compared to Papago Park? Oh, that's that's a really good question. Uh, 
that's actually a question that Julia Johnson should answer because when Julia mapped the Phoenix Mountains, she recognized that there was an unrecognized fault between the Phoenix Mountains and Camelback. And she named that the Paradise Valley Fault. Uh, I don't know if that scared any people living in Paradise Valley. Sorry, Lindy. But uh, the, uh, and, and so there's, there is a, there's a big east-west fault in there. And the rocks on the south side of that are dipping to the north. Like, you know, you think Camelback is dipping to the southwest, but it's not. It's dipping to the north and northwest. And so, you know, it's like it's a lateral feature between different extending terrains or or a big, you know, some kind of a really funny fault. Uh, the the rocks out at Red Mountain also have this funny dip. So there, there's some weird stuff going on. But it, it, that fault, I think, is responsible for the for the weird dip of Camelback. And Cla Chad, glad you joined us. That was fun. All right, we uh, okay. At least I'm looking at the time. So there's a couple of bigger questions we'll get to at the end. Of, I'm, I'm, so those people who asked them, we'll, we'll get to those. But there's there's another one that's keying off of what you just said with the Appalachians. Um, I didn't realize that the Appalachian used to be so large. Can you perhaps draw a comparison between how they used to be compared to the modern day Himalayan range? Yeah, the, the Appalachians I think were way bigger than the Himalayans. The Himalayas are pretty kind of narrow. I mean, they have Tibet associated with them. So I, I think if you took if you took the Himalayas plus a third of Tibet, you'd have the right width. Now, you know, this that's a Kip Hodges question. He could he could maybe, you know, answer that better than me. But uh, but yeah, it, it I think it was a big, broad thing, because remember, the Himalayas is the collision between the wimpy subcontinent of India with Asia, whereas the Appalachians was a collision between North America, South America, and Africa. And, and, and that went, that collision belt went, you know, all the way from, you know, Scandinavia, all the way through the Appalachians, all the way through the Wachita's down in Arkansas and Mississippi, and went all the way to West Texas. And then there's some, there's some rocks like that in uh, Mexico. And so that that mountain belt is a really long mountain belt, and it was a big collision. And so there's every reason to think that was a way bigger mountain range than the Himalayas. All right. So now we'll wrap up with a few bigger questions. So Josh Miranda says, uh, asks, you know, you talked about volcanoes, right? So what would you say is the most dangerous eruption ever recorded and known to man? Yellowstone, <laughs> you know, I don't, it, you know, it's 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 a draw. You know, if you were around when the Siberian traps came out, that would have killed everybody, or you know, at least a lot of people. And so, so that's worse. If you're in North America, something like Yellowstone was really bad. You know, the, the Yellowstone eruption, if it happened, would bury the entire Great Plains agricultural province, and so that would not be a place you'd want to be. This would not be a uh, you know, country you'd want to be around because everybody would be starving. So, all right. And uh, last question, Jane Rector asks, "What kinds of geologic markers made by humans do you think might mark this period of time in a couple million years? Will there be any?" Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the geologic markers is like when people core into recent materials. A lot of times there was a time period when we had pop tops on cans and the pop tops actually came off. They weren't they didn't stay attached to the can. And so there's a pop top horizon in the deep sea deposits. And so there are things like that. And of course, there are things like isotopes. Uh, you know, once we started blowing off atomic bombs in the atmosphere, that put a whole bunch of stuff in the atmosphere that doesn't normally live there. And so that's pretty easy to find as well. So, yeah, you know, I think it, it'll be basically debris, you know, plastics, if that stuff survives, a variety of things like that. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much. That was, uh, that was a very nice overview and, and, and fun answering the questions. Um, Steve, I see you just popped up. Semkin, did you, uh, you want to say something at the end? No, just thank you, Steve. That was fantastic. I, okay. I've been, I, I was on another line for a little while, but I've been here the whole time. Okay. Well, great. Thanks. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming. It was fun. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That was thanks wonderful. Okay. Bye. See y'all next I week. I was going to ask oh. you a question, Steve, about why the Maria Folden thrust belt is oblique to the severe belt, but uh, um, yeah, I, I think I think it's it's partly because there was an there was a basin there.
before that. There was a kind of a west-northwest trending basin that deposited the lower part of the McCoy Mountains formation. Mm -hmm. And so I think you had some pre-existing structures there. And, and those structures, I think, local, helped localize these, this deformation. That or, you know, it was such a weird stress field that yeah. that's just the orientation you got. The severe belt was more or less, uh, you know, west-northwest to east-southeast right. compression, whereas the laramide is northeast-southwest. And so I think it was that switch over to the laramide. Cool. Yeah. Did, you and, uh, did you and Tony ever publish his thesis? Uh, we did not because he went and worked with Carl in New Mexico and it was all going to get published as part of that. Oh, okay. Cause then, and then, and then Tony got hired by an oil company and makes all right. kinds of money. And so he's not interested anymore. So I yeah. see. Well, anyway, so, that so, was, that was a fantastic presentation. Okay, great. Thanks y'all. So that, was, that was great, Steve. Thank you very, very much. Okay. Bye.